uh, welcome to this special virtual tasting event, which is exploring the evolution. And this is your chance to take a deep dive into all seven whiskies from the Whiskey Maker Reserve series, our internationally award-winning series. Before I pass you over to our host for the evening, I just want to go through some housekeeping. So tonight's webinar is being recorded as well as streaming live on our Facebook and YouTube. So if you miss anything or are not able to attend the full session, you'll be able to revisit on these channels. We also, of course, invite your question, comments and questions. So please look at the Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question, I'll try my best to get this sent over to your hosts. And that just leaves me now to hand you over to our hosts, which is uh, Grace Gorton and Luca Rapetti. Hey, good evening. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, so welcome. Um, we're currently in the Whiskey Studio. And before we get stuck into the Whiskey Makers Reserve, and we, before we go into um, lots of detail about it, we just wanted to introduce ourselves first. Um, so I am the Whiskey Analyst at The Lakes. I've been here since 2019. Um, so I've fortunately been here right from when we released our first Whiskey Makers Reserve. Um, and then, of course, um, until our seventh one, which has been this year. Um, my role in a nutshell, I'm involved in the whole whiskey making process. Um, and I kind of take a step back from it. Um, I'm more of a proactive role. And most importantly, I am um, always focused on quality above all else. Um, I'm also more involved towards the end of the process. So I manage our cask warehouses. Um, and I am involved in the blending process. So I worked with Dabble um, when he was our whiskey maker, and I now work with Sarah, who is, of course, our current whiskey maker. Um, yeah. And uh, my name is Luca. So I joined Lakes Distillery just a little bit like more than a year ago. Um, my background is actually hospitality. So this is my first job uh, in the whiskey. Uh, but it's been a very exciting uh, journey because, of course, I started more as a, you know, um, you know, from the other side of the industry uh, as a big fan of the lakes. And when I had the opportunity uh, to join the lakes, it was uh, definitely something that I really wanted to do. Um, my role is a prestige developer and manager, which means that um, I look after the market in London. So I'm responsible for sales, but also because of my background in uh, bartending, I also uh, work on the development and creation of some of the perfect serves that we um, have in place now to showcase the versatility of our product, especially for the whiskey. And we talk about that a little bit later. And yeah, I think we yeah. are ready to start. Go. Okay, um, perfect. So I wanted to first give high level what the series and what the reserve um, bottles are all about. So from a high level, before we go into each one, um, the Reserve Series is really, or really showcases um, how we've developed our house style and how we've developed our signature style. So 2019 was when we re released our first one and actually we were released number one and number two, both in 2019, so in September and then October. Um, we've then changed and developed over time and there's multiple reasons as to why we developed a series why you know we chose to number one to seven and um, but really everything was because we're a young distillery we of course our first single malt was in 2019 and to release a permanent product at that point almost would have been quite limiting you know we didn't have a huge amount of stock so from a logistical perspective it would have been challenging um, to replicate that year after year. And also we had a lot of learnings as a distillery. So we're brand new. We don't understand, you know, what impact our environment has, how will our kind of casks behave in this particular location? How will our new mix spirit develop? And um, so many factors to consider. So this showcases in a way though that journey and that learning. And um, it is definitely not to say that number one <laughs> is less superior than number seven because we learn more. And um, it's just that we explore different avenues. And from that, we're now at a point where we're confident with our volumes and our stock to be able to achieve this permanent product going forward. Um, and we're confident in what we've learned along the way so that we can showcase the very best of the lakes. So we can say this has been the first chapter, you know, yeah. for the distillery, you know. So now we learn and now we know the direction from uh -huh. a single moment. Yeah? Absolutely. And yeah. 
we've always been focused on sherry cask whiskies, like sherry matured whiskies and sherry casks is is what we love as a distillery. Okay. You know, both our whiskey makers have come from Macallan, and um, and as as lakes, we want to showcase all of those characteristics and focus on them. Okay. So of course the series, um, and you know you can tell straight away by the color, um, we just wanted to harness all of those great characteristics from the sherry casts. Just uh, because you mentioned the color, I think it's also important to mention again that all our whiskey are natural color. Mm. Uh, just because it's sometimes you know we've got people, especially from yeah. my side, they're asking. Um, so they are all natural color, as you probably know, but also we don't do any chill filtration, which, you know, is again, is another thing that we see nowadays, distilleries, they don't do much anymore. Um, so just uh, things to mention. Mm -hmm. And uh, what can we say, Grace, in terms of, uh, you know, overall, uh, the cask, you know, that being used, or like, let's say the main influence mm -hmm. from the cask for, for the series? So overall, and I'll go into Elevage, um, which is a forms an essential part of, of making these whiskies. But overall, we focused on American and European oak and predominantly seasoned with PX and Oloroso. Okay. And red wine. But, and I'll go into Elevage quite soon because I think it'll make most sense. Um, there's a huge amount of different casks or different number of casks that are being used along the way. Um, okay. So they predominantly share those... You know, coming cast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know with the levage, as you said, yeah, we yeah, explain it, it It's a tricky one, tricky, and it's, yeah. it's a complication that we have as a company to try and translate yeah. the complexities of elevage in a way that you know consumers can understand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. So don't worry, because we're going to cover, as Grace said, we're going to cover the topic of the Elevage, because mm -hmm. it's basically, let's say, the heart of the whole series, but also the way we make whiskey. Mm -hmm. So I think we can start, uh, well, number one. Yeah, number okay. one, of course. So you said September 2019, so the release of the Whiskey Maker Reserve number one. Um, so we have, uh, of course, like the bottle. One thing that we can notice, first of all, um, well, that this release in particular was numbered. Yeah. Okay? So we had the number of the bottles. We also have a cask strength. Yeah. So why cask strength? We decided like, mm -hmm. to put on the label cask strength. What was the reason? So... Both number one and number two were bottled at cast strength. Um, and really at that time, the reason for that was because we wanted to be bold. We wanted to be really confident. We wanted to showcase our capabilities as a new distillery. Um, I kind of what better way than to bottle it straight out of the cast. Yeah. Um, and it, it worked at that ABV. Obviously, we would never bottle something at an ABV that fundamentally the you know flavours, the aromas don't work at. But it was designed to be cast strength because okay. we wanted it to be bold. We wanted it to be. Is that was a big statement for being like yeah, this release of a distillery cast strength? Uh, you know, uh, it, it was a, like a we very it to brave be a statement. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Without, of course, like age statement. So that was yeah. definitely no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. A statement in its own right. Yes. Um, but number one and number two. Number one, if we just focus on the characters of this first. It's very bold sherry characters. So there's a lot of, oh yeah, we've got them. Almost forgot that we have a glass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of bold sherry led characters in that it's a lot of dried fruits. It's quite a lot of spice. Um, I don't really like the word punchy, but like it is fairly. Yeah, well, um, I mean, if you got like a, something, you know, with this ABV, definitely, I mean, punch is not mm -hmm. a bad but thing. It's but... not overpowering. So. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, you absolutely. know, all those, all that sweetness, all that richness that comes through isn't overshadowed by the high, high ABV. Um, it is a perfect balance. Which again is why we chose to do it at this high strength. I think from my experience with the you know with the with the consumers and with the public, uh, the first things that you know uh, you know struck the attention of the people is like, oh my god, how comes that this whiskey is such a high ABV is so smooth, mm -hmm. so you can drink it, you can taste it. Uh, and one thing that I want to say, you know, uh, from my experience, of course, each one of us find always like a way to enjoy the whiskey, you know, as we want. But please, when you taste something like this, in general, for the first time, don't add any water and please don't use any ice, okay? <laughs> because ice it literally kills, you know, these beautiful spirits. Um, but yeah, no. But just to caveat that, if you have your first sip and you try it as the ABV that's decided, 
then add water. Because I actually yeah. think if you're adding water then afterwards, you can bring different flavours, bring different aromas out of that whiskey that aren't necessarily there at the bottled APV. Can we say that the ABV in general, because we want to see then also the evolution, let's say, of the different ABV, mm -hmm. is a kind of like, in a way, is the dress that the whiskey maker decide to give to the bottle? Oh, yeah. Can yeah, we say I that? I have that analogy. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay. Because I always think if we would have bottled this one at the not 58, uh, probably it would have been a different whiskey. Not oh, first absolutely. Um, yeah. And one of the first things I remember when I was starting to get involved in the studio side of things, in the blending, um, I was amazed at how different the whiskeys behave at different ABVs. You know, all of these, the strength of all of them was designed to showcase the whiskey in the best possible way. So, when we get towards the end of a prototype, um, we'll set it up from 46.6% is the lowest we'll go. Um, and we'll set that up all the way to Castro. And then we'll see within, you know, we'll set it up in, let's say, increments of five. And then within those, we'll narrow it down even further within the ones that we think it performs best at. Okay. And we'll keep doing that process until we get to the one that, you know, the characters shine through the, the best. Okay. Um, and one of the first things that I was looking at was like, what? I couldn't believe, you know, 0.2%, yeah. 1%, a huge change. Um, and it maybe didn't change on the nose, but it would change then on the palate. Oh, palate. Um, really interesting, the impact that the ABV does have on character. Um, but yeah, it just, I remember that in the studio, it was just so interesting. But I'd always recommend, like Luca saying, look at it at the strength that it's been designed at, and then if you want to add water. Absolutely. But no ice, ice, please. <laughs> no ice, please. <laughs> okay. No, maybe no ice. Um, no, you just, uh, we, we said, you know, the, definitely you got the spicy note um, on the whiskey. Uh, and absolutely, I mean, I'm sure you can agree that you don't feel at all the alcohol, you know, don't feel this like a punchy, punchiness coming to the, to the nose. But um, I was like, you know, Smelling again, and I got also some fruity notes. Mm -hmm. uh, so very, very delicate, which is again, um, I believe with such a high RBB, certain floral and fruity notes also comes up mm -hmm. because probably they are like the weakest one compared mm -hmm. to maybe the heaviest of the spices. Um, so, you know, it's absolutely, I mean, it's really, really uh, already like complex on the nose. Um, and all of them, they're all designed, the whole series is designed to be super complex, flavour packed. Like that, that is what the whole Whiskey Makers Reserve series is all about. So they all share that DNA. They all share those similar sherry characteristics. They're all rich. They're all, you know, have lots of dried fruits, a fair amount of spice. Um, but each one has its own you know, unique characters that make it a little bit different. Um, so number two, number two is it's slightly more subtle than number one. Um, now, of course, it's still, you know, the very high ABV, but there's a vanilla and there's a more, okay, more delicate, yeah. more like softer characteristics that come through. Um, and that really is because in the number two, we started to introduce or we start to use more American oak. More American oak, yeah. So that there's light characteristics of coming from that. I almost feel like in the number one, because when we say European oak, we know the European oak in general we can, means like Spanish oak and French oak. Yes. I feel like that, um, you know, this like fruitiness that I got on number one, there might be a little bit coming from also in some French oak, uh, that mm -hmm. sometimes you've got this like apple, pear and some apricots. Mm -hmm. But definitely you've got the vanilla here mm -hmm. in the number two. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can feel it. It's a lot more subtle. It's a lot softer. Um, but it's still actually higher than BB. Slightly higher. Yeah, still slightly. Higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slightly, slightly higher. higher. Um, and yeah, it just, it just goes to show, but you can still tell that there's that same DNA between them. Um, and before we go through into the next whiskies, um, I just want to touch on the Elevage process. So... As I said before, um, all of the series shares quite similar cast types. Can I ask you first one thing? Oh, yeah. so, so about the élevage. Yeah. So where where we got the inspiration, you know, for the élevage? So is it something used already, like by other, you know? Produced? In the cognac industry, I believe. Yeah. Um, is is where it's been used. So it is used in other in the making process of other wine spirits. Um, so we've somewhat borrowed it. 
and okay. applied it to whiskey making. Okay. As far as I'm aware, it's not used in whiskey making, um, or certainly not, you know, widespread. Um, and it was developed, well, it was developed, obviously, and it was used, you know, back in 2019 before this whiskey was um, released. And it's been used throughout the, all of these whiskies okay. because, like I said, they all share very similar casts, very similar, um, you know, oaks. So how are we getting these different characters? Um, and how are we getting the complexity um, in such a short space of time? You know, we sure. started distilling in 2014. We're not very old as a distillery, but we do have really complex whiskies. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and what Elevage is, is it, in, sim in simple terms, it's the movement of whiskey between different cast types to layer flavour. So imagine if we consider these glasses that we have in front of us here as a cask. Yeah. So what it could be like an NIDO elevage if we have like this cask. Yeah, so each, so this, the studio is actually set up because um, Sarah's here and we're going to be blending tomorrow. Um, so we've kind of fit our glasses around <laughs> it, but it is a perfect example to showcase. So all of these smaller bottles that you can see here, each one of these is a cask. Um, and almost the first stage of Elevage and the fundamental part of the whiskey maker process is understanding every single cask. So all of these samples are set up here. They're sort of about 20% ABV, so it's quite low. Um, and- Is there any reason why 20%? Yeah, well, some people have a preference for slightly higher, some slightly lower, but 20 okay. is normally the norm. Okay. Um, because the, the lower ABV allows certain characteristics to come out that might be overshadowed at a okay. higher ABV. Okay. Um, and also, it you know, you're nosing hundreds and hundreds of samples. Yeah, I mean, at uh, higher ABV, of course, your nose. Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so they're all set up at 20%. And... What we'll be doing at this stage is scanning them. So seeing how they're behaving, you know, based on what spec they are, is this what we'd expect of this cask? What are our predominant characteristics? So, you know, is it dried fruits? Is it citrus? And we can start to kind of pick apart the stock and almost create pockets of similar characteristics. So let's say we've got these, you know, 40 casks down here, mm -hmm. we might select out these 40, um, 20, because 20 of them have a really nice dry fruit note. Okay. So let's say a B grade dry fruit. Okay. From that B grade dry fruit, and this is where the intention um, comes into it, and which is a really essential part of Elevage, the intention okay. behind every step. Okay. So the whiskey maker's intention at that point might be, okay, well, I want to add a different dimension to this dry fruit. So I'm going to add, oh, I don't know, 10 mm -hmm. B-grade citrus. And I'm just using pure examples here, B-grade citrus. And I'm going to add those in, and then we're going to mix them and fill them into a different cast type. Okay. And that might be a different oak. It might be a different seasoning. It might be a different size. Okay. And we'll mix them into there because of the intention behind it, which is to add a particular dimension that the whiskey maker knows that cask can give. So you move the entire liquid, let's say, from one cask and inside the other, or just a part of the liquid? The whole cask. So let's say it was 20, 20 of these ones and then 10 of the new addition. Yep. You would mix them all into our big blending tank. Okay. Um, Make sure it's consistent, and then you'd be filling straight into your new cast type that you just. Okay, in. perfect. Okay. Um, you'd then have those casts. You'd have them then maturing. Okay. The location, you know, you decide on yeah. that. Do we want them at the top of the racking? Do we want them at the bottom? It's temperature, the level yeah. humidity, you know, yeah. for the season. There's a lot of variables. Okay. Um, and then we'd put them, and they'd mature again. The time for that depends on what the whiskey maker is expecting. It might be three months, it might be six months, it might be eighteen months. Okay. Um, and that's really where the intuition of the whiskey maker comes in. Okay. And then after that time, we might sample those casts, and you know, a, ten of those might be, oh no, you know what? These are that's elevated, and I like that extra layer that's developed from that process. But now let's take five of those casks mm -hmm. and two of these slightly different ones and let's mix them and fill them into a slightly different cast type to add another dimension. Okay. So this is happening on a vast scale. So that example is one example of, let's just say, a component. So it's not yeah. quite a prototype, it's still a component. 
Um, and that's one example of a component. But as you probably noticed, there's spare parts of that component that haven't been included. Okay. And they're getting used in different pockets in different ways. So as we can understand this, like it requires a an incredible knowledge of the cask, mm -hmm. not just of what the cask has been seasoned with, let's mm -hmm. say, previously, but also the type of book. So the yeah. way how we react uh in the how are warehouse so what's the you know the what's our environment the environment yeah. exactly and then of course it's like from well your point of view and of course like the warehouse team like constantly like sampling yeah so it's like no yeah. stop it's it's a lot of work um you know i'm part of the whiskey making team and of course i manage the cask warehouses and we are constantly sampling okay. we're constantly you know, doing trials to understand the impact of location. And we've got a kind of long-term trial going on just now to understand the impact okay. um, in depth. And it, it is a lot of work. You know, mm -hmm. we have seven days a week warehouse. and um, We have a big team um, compared to our size as, as a distillery and as a company. Um, but it's important to us because it, it, well, it's vital to us because it's how we create this complexity. Um, and it just forms the backbone of all of these whiskies. Okay. Um, but it, as you can see, it's kind of like a web of flavor possibilities. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, I like always to describe that is when you have your color, color palettes, you know, for the main colors, it's like creating shades of different colors. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm not saying like infinite, like a shades of color, but mm -hmm. the more you create, the more then option you have to start, you know, painting based on your inspiration yeah. when is the time. Yeah. You know? Of course, you know, as the same for an artist, you need to have a knowledge of if I mix a little bit of red with a little bit of yellow in certain mm -hmm. quantity, what color will come? And then you do the same with the liquid, of course. Yeah. Then I assume that there are things that you can control. I don't know if in a season it is extremely cold, extremely yeah. uh, wet, or extremely like hot there are because we know that the wood like expands mm -hmm. and, you know, um, based on, you know, humidity and temperature. So there are things that we can control. But no. um, I just want to ask you, Grace, because actually uh, I never, I think, ask you this question. What has been for you, let's say, especially with the Levage, the biggest challenge that you face, um, you know, with the Levage and with this continuous, like, process of sampling, analyzing, mm -hmm. taking, like, and recording the data? What's the biggest challenge? Um... The biggest challenge for me personally as part of my role is capturing the data from it all. Okay. Yeah. So it obviously all of this has to be recorded. You know, this old HMRC has to be reported every month for that jazz. And there's a lot of paperwork. Um, so of the journey that each cast goes through, because it has that infinite, you know, possibilities, yeah. to be able to track that is the challenge for me. Okay. Um the the work that goes in you know the physical work we can manage that and um, we do a lot of forecasting and a lot of planning and you can, you can manage that and that's part of that every day but the kind of data side of it i'm making sure that you know i want to be confident that this cask here i've got full information on okay. where it's been what was it previously mixed with and um, how long was it kept where was it kept and that's really hard um, and <laughs> Like we at the moment we have a series of Excels. Um where we're okay. I was about to ask you, do we have like a pile of paper? No, <laughs> no, 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 quite God, no. I avoid paper at all costs. But we have a lot, we have a lot of Excel spreadsheets. We are now in well, soon getting a cast management system. Okay. Um, where we will barcode the casts, and of course okay. that streamlines everything. Absolutely. Um but I think that is well, it's just part of the process is part of Elevage, but it's a challenge for me, definitely. Cool. Because what I don't want, you know, this is essential late information and we want to continuously learn from this process and be able to pass it on to, you know, the, the next people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so I want to, for me, make sure that all of that information is there and is ready. Yeah, because also, you know, we're going to need for future like project or, you know, mm -hmm. Or anything you know we are creating our own database mm -hmm. okay so in the meantime i was like keep uh smelling you know uh and tasting number one and number two which again it's incredible because uh for such a high abb they're still so smooth um it's really really so much flavor that's uh, so, so much through. so much yeah, but yeah, yeah. you can you can definitely feel the difference so uh, again here we can see already the example of um elevage that you just explained because you know very similar abb and 
complete, almost completely different yeah. like profile of the whiskey, yeah. especially in the palate. Um, okay, so um, I don't know um, if uh, before like moving uh, now to the number three and um, you know and the others, if there is any you know maybe question or some if we have any question from the audience. Yes, we've got a question here. Um, so uh, we've had someone ask, are there any types of casks that have been consistently used across the full series? Um, yeah, definitely. I would say Oloroso, Sherry, um, and it, European Oak, and PX to a point. But I think Oloroso Sherry has always formed part of these. It's always an essential yeah. component of each one of these. The proportion of the Oloroso and the proportion of the PX, that's where the differences come through because it's how long each cask is spent in that particular cask type. I think from my knowledge, Oloroso, we can see also in other whiskey, you know, from other producers, but it's been always used and still used because Oloroso is what gives you like the body and the structure, you know, to the whiskey. Then of course you can play on top of that. that yeah. Oloroso yeah. gives you the body, gives you the structure. And of course the spiciness that is like, you know, we have in this case like more predominant in number one, let's say so far, but um, you can see that is used. Uh, I'm not sure like use on his own probably would be too much mm -hmm. because, you know, it's probably too, you know, overpowering. But yeah, Oloroso for, you know, for my knowledge is, the one you use the to give the structure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, you could argue, you know, PX potentially, but it's definitely to a lesser extent of the compared to the other or so. Okay. Um, it's been kind of consistently used within the model, but just to different proportions. Okay, so uh, we don't have any other questions currently, uh, but just to let everybody know the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of the screen, please feel free to ask any questions about the series, anything about Grace or Luca, just any, if you've got any burning questions at all, please ask and I will uh, I'll get them sent through. But uh, if you guys want to carry on and move over to Whiskey Maker Reserve 3. Okay, so number three. So uh, the first things that I can say for number three, I mean, first of all, looking at the label is already the BB, so it's already a big change, mm -hmm. okay? So we can see here is a 54%. Yeah. So um, what was like the big difference apart from the BB, but, uh, and the choice, of course, like the BB, I believe reflects also the profile of the, the whiskey moving from the one and the two. So do you think there was a big change in terms of like profile, of the whiskey between the one, two, and then the three, mm -hmm. or um, um, kind of yes and no. Like there is, there's a fundamental shift. Um, you know, by the time this was released, I mean, what year was this? Twenty twenty was when number three was yep. released. Um, and of course, since then, you know, we've got casts that have been laid down um slightly differently. We've learned from yeah. you know the so one and knowledge, the of course, and like we're acquiring more knowledge. Um. But the principle is still the same. Yes, the ABV has changed, but the ABV changed because the 54 was what number three performed best at. Um, and the number three, I mean, whenever I have a look at it, um, for me, it's always really aromatic, mm -hmm. particularly on the nose. Like there's like incense, yeah. um, there's different characteristics than the really sherry, classic sherry ones, is what I would say one and kind of two, two is more vanilla -ry. But number three is the introduction of the more aromatic side. Yeah. Um, go more like, um, uh, for me, in the nose, you go more fruit notes, but different than the fruit notes that I go number one. Um, so this is like more... Uh, uh, I get like orchard fruits. Yeah. Absolutely. Like there's a more delicate fruit character and you it probably links to the ABV. You yeah. know, that slightly lower allows those more delicate characters to come through. I think is uh I would say probably of the three that we taste so far, this is definitely in the nose, is uh, the lightest, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. Um not because of the ABV, yeah. So um yeah, so I got this note of like peach. Yeah. yeah you got the note of peach, and absolutely. Number three, I mean the elevage process, I mean. We don't detail a huge amount of cask information and um, hopefully based on how I've described Elevage, you can understand why. So, yes, we're saying that Oloroso, PX, you know, red wine, particularly in these in these um, later ones, 
they are the predominant casts, but it's not limited to those. So, you know, there's this, and, and I like having all the information, and there's a lot of um, uh, companies that do give you full transparency. You can see yep. all the information of how long it's been in there, you know, how, you know, the toasting level, um, but it's just not as relevant for us to talk about that and for us to translate that on the label because of the impact and because of how important Elevage is. But also because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it would be almost impossible well, yeah. to get Elevage. Yeah. How can we say, yeah, we, we toast for this at this level because we probably have the influence mm -hmm. of so many cats mm -hmm. that that would be impossible. But your back label would be yeah. like... It would be like a book, like yeah. a separate book. Yeah. So that, that, that's why it was also the answer that I always say to the people, uh, why or why you as a distillery, you don't give us so many information on web because we are, as far as we know, the only one using the Elevage. So with the Elevage, if we have to track every single like things in detail, probably seriously, we will need like to publish like a book for each release. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's a challenge that we have as a company. Um, you know, we want to be transparent. We want to give the information that consumers want, which obviously is cast type. It is, you know, all those, all those kind of bits that, that everyone wants and expects now. But we have a challenge of trying to translate Elevage to the consumer. Um, and it is challenging because it's it's hard to understand in a relatively short space of time. It's my biggest challenge because when I explain yeah. it, because, you know, my role, of course, is like, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm going to say like translating, you know, this yeah, in, yeah, a, yeah. in a way that the people can understand. And of course, Elevage, because, you know, uh, no many other producing, if not uh, no one use it, is difficult for the people to understand. So that's why... Tonight is the opportunity, and especially when you taste the whole series, is the opportunity to understand. But um... number three, like as an example, number three had a slightly higher proportion of forecasts, and we believe that the lighter kind of orchardy fruits, those characteristics, are coming from that slightly higher, you know, proportion. But of course, it's not limited to that because of how the journey of so how they've gone through all of those different cast types is how those characteristics have come about um so you know as much as there's podcasts in here there will be an element of podcasts in yeah you know, exactly. later on certainly but it's different code it's difficult to track and different understand amounts, when, different, yeah, yeah. different location like it's this giant exactly. whatever. <laughs> and for the same reason also it's very difficult with the lavage or let's say pointless saying you know this whiskey has uh, certain you know ears because you know we combine the liquid i mean whiskey with different profile of course because they've been aged in a different way that it's really difficult like to say you know what's the age of the, the liquid inside okay. also because it's not our focus um one thing i want to say is that now that i taste twice number three because i always like to taste the the twice the spirits because mm -hmm. the first time I just clean my yeah. wash my palate the mm -hmm. second time is when I can feel more. I think the fruit notes that you said and also like more the delicate notes you feel very much in the palate. Yeah, you feel very much in the palate, but the aftertaste is so long. Oh, okay. uh, it's uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the number one, number two did I have aftertaste, but now with the fifty four percent, I can feel that actually uh, it's almost like more velvety, but I still got in my back of yeah. my palate is coming through yeah, more yeah, and yeah. more and more. And it, and it's that textural element. And again, um, we believe that complexity is coming from the Elevage process. Um, and all of these whiskies share that characteristics. Like they're really quite bold on the palate, and they have a very long oh, thinning. Yeah, well, um, and they they're quite sweet and quite Moorish. Um, and those layers of flavour are coming through from how we've blended them and how we've utilised all of the different casts that you know that we have in our repertoire. So uh, now we have, well, I would say like it's exactly in between. It uh, is. Look at that. Uh, exactly <laughs> in the between, uh, and well, we can't say that is the most important because I think it wouldn't be fair. But yeah. definitely, you know, um, number four is. Um, I just want to say, like, personally, number four, uh, this um, interesting, like, anecdote, because when I was still working in hospitality, um, the, you know, uh, my colleague Travis, when he came uh, the first time to the bar, I didn't know anything about the lake. So he came with uh, two bottles, mm -hmm. okay? One was a uh, whiskey maker edition for later, mm -hmm. and one was a number four. And this was before winning, you know, the world. Yeah. 
And when I taste them, and again, I didn't know anything about, um, you know, English whiskey, but the lakes in particular, I just say to him, uh, oh my God, so this whiskey, it's really, really amazing. And because there was nothing in my, you know, selection of spirits like that, I said to him, uh, this one will go in the menu from next week because I love it. And I probably should have bought a few more bottles yeah. at that time because then, uh, um, yeah, whiskey maker reserve number four, um, as you probably know, was awarded World Best Single Mold um, 2022. Um, and, you know, I wasn't there yet, um, you know, uh, with the lakes, but of course I was on the other side as, you know, as a fan, um, as a whiskey lover. Um, but yeah, it was an incredible award. Oh, yeah. Um, amazing. I mean, I remember when um, Kirsty is our commercial director and she kind of told us the news and, yeah, everyone was just over the moon. Um, it really is, well, it's just amazing to have something like that. Um, Which I say, for such a young distillery and mm -hmm. also for a whiskey that doesn't have any age statement, has a quite important ABV. Uh, and again, English, which if we look at like at the past winner of uh, that competition for the World Whiskey Award, you know, there were some names that they are like giant. Oh, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that was, of course, an uh, incredible achievement. But beside that, um, you know, um, I remember that there was something in number four. Mm -hmm. I didn't taste previously number three, number two, or number one. But number four, there was something that, again, I didn't taste in any of the whiskey that I have at that time, but also probably since a very, very long time. Well, so what, what do you think was the difference of the uh, extra? Everyone always asks this question. Whenever <laughs> we get close, whenever they're always like, what was number what four? What was number four? <laughs> um, so number four, from, from a characteristic perspective, it, for me, is the most, well, maybe not the most, but is very refined. So there is a perfect harmony of the different characteristics within this whiskey. Um, and it's refined. There's a particular note of honey or manuka honey, like a, almost a slight medicinal quality um, that, that comes from particularly for me on the nose. And it's, I think that refinement that just, well, it just kind of captures you, you know, when you experience it, when you nose it, when you drink it, and um, you're captured by those qualities, that perfect balance. And it's actually similar, I think, to seven in that refinement. Mm -hmm. And there is that really nice balance. And it's not to say that these other ones aren't as refined, but the other reserves are quite distinct in their characters. You know, number one was very bold and um, very sherry focused. Number two, slightly more vanilla. Number three, slightly more aromatic. You got a bit Each of everything has, yeah. in number four. Can't, yeah, and this it's that okay. harmony yeah. where each of the others is fairly distinct and has a bit more of a personality in a way. Mm -hmm. This is a really nice refinement of the yeah. more. I think it was a showcase. Um, again, number four is just a, a already lower ABD, so 52, so we can see already the journey. But I think number four is already a step towards, you know, um, the side and then we will achieve like with the with the other release but it was already like a big statement saying i think we already understand what's going on mm -hmm. and, and what we we can achieve you know with the levage mm -hmm. um because you know number four is definitely um it's like something that uh, can you know take all these three combine them together in, in different elements but as you said make it like super balanced and again the aftertaste, uh, you know, and uh, the texture is really, really mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely. It just keeps going. Yeah, um, it's going. And I think before we get into the rest of the reserves, um, I just want to touch on our new make and our kind of distillery side of things. Yep. Um, we talk a lot about maturation and that obviously is because it is incredibly important to us and it's where we do focus a lot of our intention on. Um, but we are nothing without obviously our distillery and without our new make spirit. So this room here, the whiskey studio, is the start and the end of the whiskey making process. So we kind of backwards engineer our new make spirit. Um, and up until this point, it's always been one style of new make. So we've made the same profile of new make since oh, 
Like 2020, when I joined in 2019, we still did a lot of trials. There was a lot of different yeasts that we were trialing, a lot of different parameters, um, and we kind of locked that down at the end of 2020. But we focus on one profile, and how we have got to that profile has been in this room and developing, well, thinking about what flavor characteristics do we want. So as part of this process, we know that we want really complex, sherry led, we want um, that richness, we want those layers, and we know what casks that we need to source for that. We know we've got the other bottle process, so we want to make a new make that's compatible with that process. Um, so that's how we've gone through it. We've started in here, and we've started towards the end of the process of whiskey, and we've developed it then backwards from that. So our new make is a kind of light fruity, fruity okay. cereal. Um, we do have copper and stainless steel condensers, which um, it's enables a big us. Difference. Yeah, oh, a huge difference. Um, the copper gives a very light, fruity, estuary. Yeah. If you then switch to the stainless, and if you go in the still house, it absolutely reeks because um, there's loads of sulfur. Okay. So loads of sulfur coming through. You haven't got the copper there to stripping out those impurities. Um, and we don't focus on the stainless at the moment, but we will going forward because we're wanting to look at, okay, let's, we've got all these complexities that we know we can achieve in Elevage, but we can actually add another dimension to that through our new make spirit. So we can look at flexing our distillery now. We can use stainless, we can use different fermentation times, different yeast, and we can flex that profile to open up more of those possibilities. Um, but throughout all of these whiskies, we were using the same new make spirit. And this is uh, what I think, I and I say to the people, it's amazing to see, again, starting from one type of liquid, so for our new make spirits, not, not maybe like from two different ones, we create all our whiskey, including the whiskey maker edition. So it shows that uh, you know, with the uh, elevage that is very challenging, as uh, you know, uh, Grace explained, but we can achieve uh, so much, mm -hmm. and we can literally go from you know light and floral to you know spicy and mm -hmm. heavy. We can cover like so many like different profile mm -hmm. whiskey, but it's incredible that we have only one new experience mm -hmm. and we can make so much because some distilleries or most of the distilleries they normally have. Maybe two new experiences. Yeah, normally about two, two. Yeah. And you know, they use for different, you know, part yeah. of the you know products. Yeah. So we have only one. And I think, you know, with the whiskey maker uh, reserve, it's uh, definitely amazing to see also what we can do uh, mm -hmm. with that. And it's and that's exactly it. It was we couldn't have a new make that was fighting with our maturation process. So the new make was designed to be perfectly compatible with this product. So we say fruity. Okay. Yeah, fruity cereal. Fruity, fruity, fruity cereal. cereal. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, at the moment we're working on integrating the stainless more, okay. so that we have like a, a cereal heavy or like a kind of like a fruity cereal because the fruits are still there, but the heaviness is just elevated. And of course, if we choose to really use the stainless on the wash distillation side, and we can still use the copper on the spirit side, then we can again further tweak that. Um, and that's just one example of. A parameter change like this infinite <laughs> that goes on in the distillery um but yeah i think that's a really important point for part of this series because it just further showcases um the impact of the maturation and of the elevation process okay so now moving to the last uh i mean i wouldn't do let's say together but definitely five six seven um we can see um i like to say those three in particular, they are again an amazing example of the badge. They are all, all of them, but especially the five, six, and seven, because bottle at the same ABV, 52%. Mm -hmm. So can we say, Grace, that 52% was the final dress that we decided for our whiskey? I mean, but the one, let's say that uh, the one that fit the best for the, the last fit the best for the moment. <laughs> for the moment, yeah. For the moment, okay. It it just it worked for each of them. And I remember you know, setting them up, doing what we always do, 46 up to cast strength, and it always came down to 52 or 54. And 52 were always just slightly pitched the pitch ball. It was just, it just worked. And, you know, that that is likely because, you know, it's it makes sense in that our processes, you know, 
developed along those developed as we've gone on and naturally i guess it will fade or so it maybe be it's that process but yeah 52 was just the dress the dress it worked. Okay. that's good <laughs> um so if, uh, five six seven we can say that pretty much the you know the cask the base of the cask is the same mm -hmm. um so we know that we are talking about spanish oak and american oak um previously you know um seasoned with the oloroso px so every minutes and the red wine cask i know mm -hmm. it's very generic because everyone say ah but what do you mean for red wine cask because you know, sometimes we we can't, as you said before, we don't share the old information. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that I can uh, see, uh, especially here, that on the tasting tables we have this like neutral white, um, you know, light. I can see that from the one, two, and three, we started with a, a liquid that it was a little bit lighter. Yeah. Okay. But now from the four, but especially five, six, seven, we see that the darker liquids. Mm -hmm. So is this one because there was much more influence of, for example, like uh, this red wine cask that they also give the tannins? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think the color is a result of in part age. Okay. And I don't want to, like age is a funny one for us. I mean, we're no age statement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the colour is a result mainly from age. Okay. You know, like these, obviously these whiskies are slightly older than these. Okay. They have had longer amount of time to gain that colour from the cast. And um, that does not mean, importantly for us, that they are more superior. Um, age statement for us is not something that we will ever focus on. Um, we want the most complex, highest quality whiskies. And if we limit that to a certain age, and um, it's limiting for us as a as a distillery, as a, you know, whiskey makers, it, it inhibits us from creating complexity. Um, and you know, there's there's so many complex reactions that go on as part of maturation that yes, age is a crucial part of maturation. We know that age, you know, maturation is nothing without age, <laughs> but it is simply not limited to the fact that the higher um, age something is, the better it is. There's so many different variables, different, um, you know, the environment it's in, and all of that um, has such a big impact that you just can't determine the high age equals well, the I, I think the best, uh, uh, you know, um, the best, you know, proof for that, the age is not important, was with the number four, when we won the best single malt in yeah. the world, because we were, you know, our whiskey, like all the other, was blind tasted. Mm -hmm. So there was no information about the age, no information. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just the taste. So when you taste, it's all about the liquid, the complexity, the depth in flavor, mm -hmm. texture. So, you know, and if we would, if we want like that, the word for this whiskey that is relatively younger, mm -hmm. you know, compared to other whiskey, yeah. Yeah. I think this is already like a proof that. Uh, age is not important. Yeah, you know, in this for case. us, it's it's Absolutely. not important. It's not something that we'll focus on or be limited by. Even because you know, leaving like a liquid, for example, for many years in a cask, uh, that's it. You know, without moving, yeah, the liquid is gonna absorb. It's gonna exchange with the cask. You know, mm -hmm. you know, all certain things, but it's gonna be still limited. Mm -hmm. You know, with the elevations, actually, there is no limit. Yeah, to the yeah, 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 yeah. The, You know, to the inputs. Yeah. You know, on the on the liquid. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. So well, number five, six, and seven, we say so pretty much same cask, uh, you know, uh, background, the same ABV. Now uh, I think number five is, um, I would say, like number four is still very balanced. Yeah. But um, I believe we got probably a little bit more influence of the PX in terms of like sugar notes or molasses. Yeah, um, for me, number crazy. five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the nose for me, number five is perfumed brown sugar, like exactly like you're saying. Um, and we can't definitely, you know, determine that that's the, the PX. Um, it's the whole process as, as we've described. But number five in particular has that rich, Almost aromatic, but more like comforting on the nose and comes through on the palate. Um, almost like 
wrong characteristics in a way. No, because it's that I agree with you. Dry yeah, fruit, yeah. sugar. You've got this ester that you got yeah. in the in the whiskey that yeah, yeah, yeah. they are similar to certain ester that you can find in some type of rum uh -huh. that's you know they they are for example like the ripe bananas yeah. or again in some rum you can find like figs dates yeah. uh you know into molasses of course yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely and and you know this is the it's the great thing about sensory is that we will all experience these things slightly differently um and i have a very keen interest in sensory science i, I just think it's absolutely fascinating um and i did a degree in food science and I did my dissertation as part of sensory science. So I, I just love the process. Um, and you will get slightly different characteristics to me. And, um, mm. you know, certain people are blind to some things, certain people are really sensitive to some things. And I think it's important to, you know, bring that up because we have tasted notes on each of these and we will discuss between us, you know, dominant characters for us. But it's not limited to that. You know, everyone is going to experience something slightly differently. And that's the beauty of this process. Um, and it's the beauty of sensory science, I think. Um, and yeah, we'll give guiding pointers. You know, we might give, oh, you know, this is more orchard fruits. But it's, it's just not limited to that. It's the enjoyment and the experience of each individual that I think, you know, should be focused on. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting. So what about number six? Because number six again, it's, it's I think different. number six it's is more dry, dry, spice. but um, aromatic quality is similar to number three for me. Yeah, I was literally because you know I remember the number three was a little bit more like we say fruity, but also lighter. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was still the of spice. So um, number six is definitely, I mean, a nose. Um, I wouldn't say like it's different than number five because number five you still got these notes as I said. Yeah. But this one you got more not well almost like floral, okay, lighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you go, I remember that you say to me ginger. Yeah, I always and get ginger. You, candy ginger. Yeah, candy yes. ginger, yeah. yeah. Candy ginger. Or when you just create like the ginger, then you got the freshness of the yeah. ginger. Um yeah. absolutely. So, you know, it's interesting because for example, five and six uh, being like sherry lead, both of them like sherry lead whiskey. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting because they already cover two different styles. So maybe if someone is looking for something more sweet, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, you know, can I mean, you know, can choose number five or someone that wants something still sherry led but more dry. Yeah. So you can go for number six. Yeah, absolutely. So. And it's it's nice. Um, I think when I was in Belgium at one of the Belgium shows, we had five and six, and it was nice having them there together. Because once, you know, after you've got talking to people and you can understand what they like, don't like, if people like the sweeter style, you know, oh, yeah, I think number five will be more up your street. Or, okay, you'd like slightly spicier, slightly more um, vibrant whiskies than number six would be yeah. more. And I I got this, like, a, you know, um, vibrant note of uh, spices but also almost like into hint of citrus notes uh -huh. in the back of the palate mm -hmm. so a bit of like zesty mm -hmm. um so it's definitely interesting um and it was these that we had the um with the bars in london it was these yep. number six so this is well exactly so it started already with the number five so with them um, starting from the number five um in uh, in London, since say uh, you know uh, it was uh, twenty twenty uh, two, we started so last year, we started like a series of collaboration with some of the top bars in London. Um, so the challenge was basically for the five, and then we done for the six, and also for the seven. You know, we wanted to give the bartender the opportunity because you know, of course, as a bartender, uh, you know, you choose to be a bartender because you want to express you know your creativity. And with this whiskey, also, we want to show the versatility of the whiskey, yet the complexity. But uh, at the same time, we wanted to give the opportunity to the bartender to create something around these whiskeys. Mm -hmm. But still, the most important things is when you, especially when you use a such high quality uh, whiskey, is to enhance the yeah. profile of the whiskey, showcase, showcase yeah. rather than just like use ingredients that they're going to take over. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to end up like, yeah, but I don't feel the whiskey. So mm -hmm. maybe the, the cocktail is nice, but I've lost a little bit of the character of the whiskey. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting to see then 
that also with this activation, I mean, with the menus also that they came out with the number six and number seven that is now live in those bar in London, see also the evolution because um, throughout this activation, we work with um, uh, different bars, but sometimes also with the same bars for a mm -hmm. couple of activation. And uh, it was interesting to see also from their side, yeah. the evolution, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. because of course, they understood the lavage, they understood also the way the concept of layering the flavors. Mm -hmm. So they applied that to the drinks because in the end, you know, what you describe for the lavage is the same way to make a drink. Mm -hmm. So we start, you know, of course, we start with the idea for the whiskey in this case, mm -hmm. but then it's about layering the ingredients, but also make sure that all the ingredients, they work together yeah. and they create complexity mm -hmm. uh, and flavors, but, you know, sometimes works, sometimes they don't work. Mm -hmm. So... I think, you know, there is like there are a lot of similarities. There are a lot of parallels, actually. Aren't absolutely. Yeah, I remember absolutely. seeing some of the footage and when they were talking about the process, it was like, oh, like like the same process that we follow in here. It's yeah. like, as you say, how they construct the absolutely. drink, how they construct those flavours has a lot of similarities. We, we talk about ABV. So for a cocktail, the way you shake it, if you shake it longer, or if you stir with the ice, so you get certain dilution, so it means like mm. a different ABV. Yeah. So, and the cocktail with uh, more dilution and lower ABV is different. That, so that's mm. why also you need to adjust these things. So I think this, um, uh, the comparison is, is is appropriate, you know, in this case. Um, and then of course, with the number seven, um, we can still see, I mean, I, see, I can still see some of this cocktail and it's incredible to see this time because one of the also challenges was for the bartender to use some of ingredients that maybe they never used before yeah you know, as a kind of like celebration for the end of the uh, whiskey maker reserve yeah so um and i saw uh some you know cocktails that they have ingredients that honestly you wouldn't expect in a whiskey based cocktail yeah you know? so that's really interesting um and i think this was a nice, I mean, this is still a nice way to celebrate then, uh, you know, the number seven as mm -hmm. last release mm -hmm. of the of the collection. And, uh, well, what we can say for the number seven? Well, number seven. So I sometimes quite like, well, it's, it's just quite nice looking at them as a series altogether. Number seven, I do think, has similarities to number four in the refinement. Um, so like I was saying earlier, each of, of the others is, is quite distinct in characters. Number seven is really balanced, really refined, and, and is kind of similar to, to number four, but I think has a bit more like robust sherry character. So there's there's a bit more of the, the dried fruits coming through. Um, there's characteristics almost of all of them that have, have you know come into the number seven. Um, it's. I mean, it's. It's kind of. Well, it is the perfect end of the series. It's an evolution on the number four, definitely. Um, I mean, more than nose because I think it's very well rounded. You know, the number seven. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, as, as you said, I think it was the best way to to complete, let's say, the experience and the journey. Yeah, and, um, and going forward, and um, we will be developing a permanent product and that permanent product is based on this whole reserve series. So it's not that we'll take number seven and we'll replicate number seven and um, it's we'll take those core characteristics from the whole series and develop that into a permanent product. Um, so that is what Sarah and I are currently kind of working on at the moment and it is very interesting mm -hmm. for, for me personally to understand you know, creating limited releases as we have here and as we do in our editions is a very different process um, to creating a permanent product because, of course, we're looking at stock now that's ready, of course. We're looking at this cask now and then we're looking at younger stock. I and, mean, you know, you pull that kind of recipe and that framework through those years so that you know that you can be 100% confident that you're going to release a product that you can replicate year after year after year. And that is very challenging. You know, every single cask yeah, has We've never done it. Well, it, yeah. We've never done it. We've never done it. So it is challenging, <laughs> particularly challenging, but it is challenging anyway because every cask is unique. This is a natural process that we are, you know, guiding and, and having an impact, but it's a natural process. So... Yeah, we can 
mold things and we can forecast things, but ultimately it's you know down to the whiskey maker to to put those steps and to make sure that it is absolutely identical year on year. And of course, I mean for the new whiskey maker, um for the new single mold, sorry, we're gonna see also the input of Sarah because it's different new whiskey maker. So we will see that's why you know whiskey maker reserve is important because it's a you know first chapter ch chapter of the distillery um and so now uh we have it and we're going to start a new chapter yeah so and you know we'll see of course what's going to come up and we can see already they work quite hard because you know we have uh quite a lot of like samples here yeah, every time i come see that this table is like packed of samples um so it's definitely yeah. very exciting we're very busy definitely <laughs> which is a good thing it's always a good thing well let's make a cheers oh, the number seven you know at least yeah, yeah. And well, Ryan, I don't know, are there any questions that have come through? Sorry, I feel like we Yes. <laughs> so uh, now that you're cheers in, uh, I've had a question asking if any of the uh, seven whiskies share any common features, all seven, one to seven, is there any common features in terms of the tasting? Well, of course, that's, like I said about the sensory analysis, it's slightly subjective, but yes, they do share similar core characteristics like for me i always get an element of dried fruits whether mm -hmm. that's raisins whether that's dates or whether that's you know only a, only a tiny component and i will always get an element of dried fruits i think like sherry if you talk yeah, about sherry, yeah, yeah, yeah. the spice whether it's like more pronounced or not you will always have like the spices mm -hmm. as you said so and there's always the richness and in particular the richness in the finish yeah and um, that is a characteristic that's shared across all of these um sure. and it's something that we really focus on because i think that's recognizable of late of, as lakes mm -hmm. you know people at shows or when we do blind tastings yeah. you can tell straight away that that is a lakes whiskey yeah and that is the whole idea behind this was to get to that point where people recognize us for a particular profile for a particular finish and um, we want to be obviously recognizable as a as a product and as an experience it's a definitely a whiskey that you know um is when you smell it is interesting and it's like complex and then when you taste it it doesn't disappear like mm -hmm. we were just chatting earlier today um that you know sometimes you you just uh, taste uh uh, amazing liquid this smells amazing and then when you taste them after a few seconds they just disappear and they left you with nothing if not just the alcohol perception and yeah um i just came back from uh, you know an event abroad and people were telling me you know you 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 recognize lakes because the lakes so when once you have in a palate mm. it doesn't leave you yeah. and it stays with you uh and it just evolved you know um and i think this is uh also a sign of because we mentioned about the new mix spirit before if we start, you know, with the attention to the details from the very beginning, and also for for you know every step of the production, but especially the new make spirit, then uh, of course this will reflect in the way also we make uh, the whiskey, which the whiskey in the final product, you know, uh, because yeah, aging is what gives you know the profile. I mean, the main characteristic to the whiskey. But if we start with the, maybe a liquid that is not really great, uh, or there are some mistakes. Uh, you know, this will, you will well, find... you're off on the wrong path. Exactly. You? You know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, uh, we can see this also consistency. Uh, yeah, different flavor, even though the spicy notes are there, you know, always there. But definitely, I would say, uh, even if you taste number one or number two, that they will probably be lighter, you, you know, they stay in your palate. Uh, Leon asks, which one out of the seven is your favorite? That's obviously to both of you. You go first. <laughs> um, again, this is just personal, eh? okay? Well, as I said before, number four um, is the one that put my attention. However, number five. Yeah, you number know five. what? And and I always find that question really hard. And we do get asked it a lot. You know, yeah. you go to a show it, or, you know, an event, quite often people want to know. Number three, I do really... I do really like, like, it, I am torn between number three and number five. <laughs> like, I really like the aromatic qualities of number three. Um, but like you, I really love the richness and just it's that, just... like, moorish, almost like a pudding yeah. of, of number five. 
yeah, number five is, you know, is is something that um, unfortunately is not available anymore. <laughs> but, uh-huh. but it's, um, yeah. Um, and again, I have to say, especially for my job, so we need to be honest, uh, when uh, number five came out in the market, we're talking about a whiskey uh, with a very, I mean, with a great quality, but the price it was coming out in the market, uh, that it was very affordable. You know, of course, this also plays a role because if you have a great whiskey and a very affordable price, uh, and you know, once you drink it, you probably you you're just enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And you, as people were saying to me, you know, when you start, uh, it's so pleasant, mm-hmm. and you don't need any water, you don't need anything else, mm-hmm. and you're still talking about fifty percent. Uh, mm-hmm. That you know, I think this is also part of the overall experience. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so that's for me was uh, yeah, I would say number five. But again. Doesn't mean that I don't like the other, but number five is is always something. What you, you know, go back to? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, just the final uh, question for the evening, and I think that you touched on it a little bit before, Grace. Uh, but now that the whiskey mis- whiskey makers reserves have come to an end, what is the next direction for the brand and distillery? Asks Colin. Big question. Um, so we are, as I said, developing a permanent product and that will be and you know it's, it hasn't got a name yet but it'll be the whiskey makers reserve as a series but as a permanent product so you know we're confident in the fact that we can have this product on the shelf year after year and the consumer the customer can you know with full confidence go and buy that product and know that it is that same flavor profile and um, that they recognize as lakes so that is a big change and a big step for us as a distillery like you're saying you know it is a new chapter and um, it's what we've been working towards throughout this whole series so that's really exciting um, and that will be coming out in 2024 so next year we also will have um so the whiskey makers editions is is our other single malt kind of series i guess so the editions each one is a deviation from the house style, from the reserve. Each one is um, unique. You know, we use different casts, different inspiration. They're very creative avenues for us as a, as a brand and as a whiskey distillery. Um, and they will actually be ending as the additions as they are now, um, but we will still continue with some limited releases. So in theory, we'll have our whiskey makers reserve, you know, permanent products we'll have a few limited releases um, and, you know, I, you know, I'm sure Sarah's got a lot more in her pipeline, but as far as I'm aware, that is, is kind of our next chapter on a very basic level. Okay, so uh, that's all of the questions. So I'm going to say that we're going to conclude like this session. So I think I'm, I will be speaking on behalf of everyone, but thank you very much for your uh, time and expertise uh, being given to us on this Wednesday evening, Luca and Grace. It's been fascinating to hear your insights and uh, your opinions. So, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone as well for uh, attending this. And if there is any questions uh, that, that might not have been answered or you do have a burning question, uh, please feel free to email me. Um, and my email is Ryan Burton at lakesdistillery.com. But um, that concludes everything. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.